strap in. Uh, we're going to do a 10 minute introduction to Kubeflow, which sounds like uh, an impossible task, but we're going to try and make it happen. We're going to cover only three things in this 10 minute introduction to Kubeflow, the basics, the architecture, as well as the components. And in subsequent lightning talks, we'll cover other facets of uh, Kubeflow, but in this one, we're just going to do a quick drive by uh, of, uh, of uh, Kubeflow fundamentals. Uh, okay, so let's get started with the basics. Let's start with the most high level premise I think that we need to understand is what does machine learning and, uh, have to do with, uh, with data science, right? Or, or I should say this, what does machine learning and data science have to do uh, with, uh, with Kubernetes? Well, there's three main reasons why machine learning is a, or, or Kubernetes is a keen interest to people who are doing machine learning. One is gonna be portability, which means that you can write once, reproduce and run uh, everywhere. The second one is going to be, um, if you're doing machine learning, if uh, you're probably going to be using a lot of services, which is a perfect fit for microservices, right? Kubernetes microservices match made um, in heaven and workflows are often gonna need to interact with multiple services. Scaling down quickly can be just as important as scaling up. If you know machine learning, you know machine learning loves GPUs. Uh, those are expensive. So Kubernetes is a perfect infrastructure for being able to ramp up and ramp, ramp down uh, very quickly. So those are the three reasons why Kubernetes and machine learning uh, are rather harmonious, portability, microservices, as well as scaling. Now, uh, the reality is, is that there's two big trends in IT and then there's one big open secret as it relates to kind of the, the focus of this particular meetup is that uh, everyone can agree that the adoption of cloud native architectures is on a tear, right? Everybody that's developing web apps, micro, microservices, et cetera, is all thinking cloud native architectures. How can I bring Kubernetes into the mix? Also, lots of companies are making big investments in machine learning and data science, especially in the enterprise, right? Which you normally think are companies that are going to be behind the curve, wait for technology to mature before they dive in. Oftentimes, these sorts of companies are going to be at the vanguard of this sort of stuff. Uh, why? Uh, but I guess there's one unfortunate thing, which is that the majority of ML models never make it to production. Why is this? Typically, it's going to be because of skills, uh, software, uh, maybe the robustness of the ML ops methodology, and the inherent difficulty of collaborating across teams, right? We expect data scientists to be Kubernetes experts, and we expect Kubernetes experts uh, to be data scientists. So it's always very challenging uh, to bring those models to market. But at this intersection of machine learning and Kubernetes is Kubeflow, right? So for the uninitiated, Kubeflow is an open source project that's at this convergence and it's an ML platform for data scientists and for operations. So it's trying to serve uh, two personas here that are essential in actually making this uh, whole ML workflow work. It's a complete toolkit for your ML workflow that is gonna be able to do your data management, your training, your hyperparameter tuning, your notebook serving, as well as your monitoring, as well as a bunch of other things. Uh, the brief historical note on this is that it was launched uh, by Google back in 2017. They used it internally as a way to manage uh, their TensorFlow uh, projects. And that's kind of how we've arrived to uh, Kubeflow. Now let's do a quick drive by on the architecture and components. Now, there's, not, there's a lot to consume here, but you don't have to consume at all. The key takeaways here are that Qflow is not a single binary. It's not a single piece of software. It is a multitude of different services that come together to provide this platform. It's all based on, it's all based on top of Kubernetes. And when, it, when you're able to build that platform on top of Kubernetes, you obviously get the advantage of being able to run it on all the major clouds, run it on bare metal or on your own. Uh, on-premise hardware, but also locally on your laptop, right? That's the whole uh, idea. So those are the takeaways that you need to get from this slide. You don't have to consume all of it. Now let's dive into a couple of these components, to understand the role that they serve inside of Kubeflow. Uh, there's six of them that we're gonna cover. First is the central dashboard. This is kind of the eye candy. This is where uh, you interact with all the magic. So the central dashboard, assuming that you successfully installed um, Kubeflow, it's your browser-based UI. And then from here, it's your gateway to interacting with the different components, depending on what stage you're in, in building your workflow. Pipelines, notebooks, Cat IB, Artifact Store, and even some contributor management, right? Um, as far as who's working on the project. That's your first piece. The second component is gonna be notebook uh, servers. And you'll see Stefano actually, as he's working through Kale, you'll see him doing a lot of work 
um, inside of notebook servers. But with notebook servers here, we're talking about Jupyter uh, notebooks and everything that you expect that you can do inside of Jupyter notebooks, you're gonna be able to do inside of Qflow. And what it ultimately does is that it allows you to basically build in a Jupyter notebook and then use that as, uh, as a starting point for being able to move that model into production. Again, Stefano's gonna cover a bunch of stuff in that. Qflow pipelines is a third component to be aware of with pipelines. Essentially, this is where you build and you deploy your portable, scalable ML workflows. They're going to be based on Docker containers. Now, there is a UI inside of the dashboard that you can leverage, but there are also two SDKs that allow you to do uh, other things that may not be readily available inside of the UI. The next component is going to be KF Serving, which is now known as KSER. Uh, and KF Serving is going to provide a Kubernetes CRD for serving models on a variety of frameworks. These frameworks are gonna include TensorFlow, PyTorch, and a few others. And what that does is that it helps enca encapsulate a lot of the complexity around auto-scaling, networking, server configuration, um, et cetera. With CatIB, this is the next component inside of Kubeflow. Uh, this is what's gonna provide your auto ML. Like KS Serving, it's agnostic to the ML framework uh, that you want to uh, use. It's also going to be leveraged in doing your hyperparameter tuning, early stopping, and a couple other things. And it's writ written in a variety of languages. And the last piece that we're going to do a, a freight train through is going to be training operators. So in Qflow, you train machine models with operators. And there's currently five operators, maybe there's six. Um, they include TensorFlow, PyTorch, MPI, MX, uh, Net. I think there might be a sixth one, but anyway, or maybe a fifth one or a sixth one. Uh, but anyway, training operators, because I think they got merged in the last release. Maybe that's why I'm confused. Uh, training operators is going to be that last uh, component. And in subsequent, you know, uh, lightning talks, we'll dive deep on, on each one of these different things. But hopefully that gave you kind of a rough outline of the Qflow uh, project. Why, why Qflow is interesting or why it should be interesting and kind of the basic components that come together to kind of deliver a complete MLOps uh, platform.